What would Yeshi do? Produced by Yeshi Studio. I'm Lindsay Kimura. And I'm Edward Reeb. What Would Yeshi Do is a podcast dedicated to Yeshi Tsogyul, the mother of Tibetan Buddhism. Today, Lindsay and I sat down and interviewed Ian Baker. Ian Baker is the author of The Tibetan Art of Healing, The Heart of the World, A Journey to Tibet's Lost Paradise, The Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, Buddhas of the Celestial Gallery. As Richard Gere put it, Ian Baker's amazing journey is really a pilgrimage into our own true selves. Ian is currently working on a book called Tibetan Yoga. Tibetan Yoga is also the principal subject of an exhibition at London's Welcome Collection, Tibet's Secret Temple, which Ian curated. And so, without further ado, let's get to that interview, shall we? Let's do it. Hi, Ian. Hi there. Happy to be here. How did you first get interested in uh, Tibetan healing, Tibetan Buddhism specifically? And was it, how old were you? Um, I was actually 19 and I was in college and an opportunity arose. I was in a small liberal arts college in Vermont and uh, which had a tradition in your junior year uh, Mm -hmm. of going abroad. And of course, there was a wide range of the usual suspects, the usual options in Europe, etc. Uh, but there was also this extraordinary opportunity that appealed to me Im- immediately and immensely, which was to go to Nepal. Uh, I was at that time a studio art major uh, studying uh, painting, and uh, I was able to to convince my advisor that uh, going to Nepal would, would uh, afford me the opportunity to study a, a traditional form of, uh, of, of painting mm. that was otherwise not you know, available. Uh, in the world currently, and to is that the of, thangka? Oh, well, tanka, 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 literally, yes. So the scroll, the Tibetan scrolls, and it's a tradition, obviously, that goes back uh, centuries and centuries, if not millennia. And uh, so that's I went under those auspices um, to to apprentice uh, in a, a project studying uh, how to make Tibetan scroll paintings, and it was that which led me uh, up to the basically uh, to the Tibetan border in 1977 wow. and studying with a traditional painter, uh, sort of literally in the shadows of Mount Everest. And it was through him that I first learned about this Tibetan tradition of what so-called hidden lands. Uh, and that came up in the context of learning to paint the uh, Tibetan kind of landscapes that form the, the, the periphery and uh, background for Is that pronounced Bayul? Beul, yes, literally. So Bay means hidden or secret, and Yul is land or country or or valley. It can can depending on context, but kind of the clearest translation is hidden land. Hmm. And they were, as you said, Beul uh, places that were described first in Tibetan texts uh, that date back to the eighth century and are considered to be places of heightened power and potentiality where. Uh, particularly practices of meditation, yoga, etc., will be greatly uh, accelerated. And simultaneously, they're places of just unique kind of, uh, you could say, biodiversity. They all have sort of sacred herbs and plants associated with them. They're all invariably considered to be very hard to reach. Uh, all of that, you know, appealed to me immensely at the age yeah. of 19. <laughs> So, because I was told immediately, you know, don't even think about trying to go to them because they're they're very very difficult to reach. And so that was immediately uh, uh, an attractive uh, made them immediately attractive to me. Wow! So these were places, if I recall correctly, Padmasambhava had uh, shown Yeshi and after or Yeshi Tsogyal. Do you know the pronunciation mm-hmm. of that? Am I getting it yeah. right? Yeah, no, Yeshit Sogyal. Sogyal. Oh, good. Yeah, Yeshit Sogyal. Yeah, that was yeah, the Tibetan princess who became essentially, or Tibetan queen in that sense, the youngest queen who became Pambasambhava's consort and who is credited with having basically uh, 
written down all his his secret oral teachings, including the directions to these hidden lands. Mm. So interesting. So, so yeah, you so, you encountered some bees at one point in one of those <laughs> Bayul. <laughs> well, bees and many more things, but <laughs> but yeah, that's what makes them so fascinating because you know, in a certain sense, they are they represent these kind of paradisical landscapes of the Himalayas, and certainly they they fueled and fed the the later. Uh, kind of Western mythology, if you will, of the Himalayas and sense of Shangri-La as these kind of earthly paradises. But they are also, uh, like any paradise, they've got you know, snakes at the center, right. uh, just like our Western tradition. And um, yeah, and not only difficult to reach, but many hazards uh, along the way. But that's what I sort of found so fascinating about the Tibetan accounts of these places, that it's, it's these very hazards that become the spiritual path. It's how we encounter hardship, difficulty, and to some degree suffering uh, that transforms experience and kind of brings us out of that sense of trying to negotiate staying in our comfort zones. And in a sense, the quest for the hidden lands is just the opposite. It's about willfully getting out of our comfort zones and encountering kind of a larger sense of reality. Wow. And Ian, did you have any obstacles that stood out to you or roadblocks in terms of your pursuits and your adventures, uh, like getting started or along the journey mm -hmm. and things that you learned from? Are there some that stood out that you could share? Yeah, let's see. I mean, as I said, it was... In my first encounter with the Hidden Lands basically came when I asked a very, even old at that time, although he just finally just passed away last year at 102, an old wow. Tibetan Lama who I knew was very, very versed in this tradition about, uh, I asked for directions to go to one of these Hidden Lands and he basically said to me, well, he answered, he, he responded with a very unusual question. He said, can you spend a month alone? Um, and I didn't quite understand what he meant, but I said, of course, if, you know, if that was something that was required, <laughs> I, I would certainly do so. And he said, come back when you have a month alone, month to spare, and I uh, will send you to a hidden land. And then you won't have to ask me what it is. You'll know for yourself. Mm. Uh, so that was, you know, again, another one of these, those kind of challenges you can't refuse. Yeah. So I, you know, back in those days, one had somehow more, more time available <laughs> So I went back in the summer when I did have time and presented myself, and he sent me uh, with these two nomads to, to, to a very small little cave where I was meant to there then stay for a month and come back and give him my account of, of the hidden land because this was in one of these hidden lands. So, so that, you know, in a certain sense, was the, the initial challenge uh, was, was – my month alone in this small little cave in the middle of monsoon that was you know, kind of perpetually wet and uh, you know all kinds of things. But but um, uh, but that stood out for me, I suppose, as an incredible. Uh, it was in a certain sense my back door into to Buddhist practice because uh -huh. it was something that I you know I wouldn't have necessarily sought out to do uh, on my own, and yet by doing it, it just it brought up so many. Many uh, things and issues that, um, you know, in moving through them, it just it sort of opened up um, a way forward, not only just to the study of these hidden lands, but just to, to life more generally and certainly to spiritual practice. Now, I know that that didn't answer your specific question. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, it's all good information. Yeah. What kind of obstacles did I particularly remember? But I would just have to say that I wasn't planning, you know, in my life and spending a you know, a month alone in a cave, and you know, I did it. I did feel a little bit more like Robinson Crusoe than than a than a Buddhist, you know, uh, <laughs> monk in a, in a cave. In the sense that a lot of it was, you know, very much survivalist, just getting enough water dripping from the cave walls to drink, mm -hmm. keeping the fire going in the monsoon, and you know, many many obstacles in that respect. So um, it, it does stand out as that kind of initiatic sort of like threshold into this kind of ongoing project about hidden lands generally. So that was one. And then um, I would say certainly, you know, the biggest one, which in a certain sense my book, The Heart of the World, is all about, was this quest for the door, as it's referred to, into the innermost secret of the most important of these hidden lands called Beyu Pimika, the hidden land shaped like a lotus uh, in southeastern Tibet. And mm -hmm. 
the the continual uh, yearly attempts to get into this innermost part of what's now recognized in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's deepest gorge was an ongoing series of, of you could say, edifying obstacles in the sense that they were they were obstacles, but they were never – they all had their – absolute point uh, which is why I sort of referred to them as edifying because they all led to, to a new approach that ultimately allowed us to, to reach this waterfall that conceals the, the door to the hidden to the innermost part of the hidden land and so the biggest obstacle I would say in that regard was basically um, uh, following the traditional um, oral instructions for how to reach this spot which were counterintuitive in the sense that we often had to head off in an entirely different direction to to uh, attain what was what is referred to in these texts as the key, uh, and it's you know at a mountain that would ended up being a three week trek into the Tibetan wilderness. So it was in a certain sense leaving one's rational mind behind to enter into this kind of uh, mythic narrative uh, in which these hidden lands partake. So. They were challenges, but they were also, in a certain sense, sort of delightful departures from life as we ordinarily know it and entering into, you know, almost what can kind of characterize as a, as a kind of dream time. Mm. Um, and all kinds of, you know, amazing things happen, both, both in a certain sense, I wouldn't say good and bad, but things that are both challenging at the same time, you know, miraculous in some respects in terms of the kinds of coincidences that would happen along the way, both meteorologically, in terms of chance meetings, encounters, timings, all of those things just started to seem almost uh, supranormal. And that's what really you know, added, at least for me, in a, you know, whether, whatever reason these things arose, it just, you, you did feel, or I felt certainly, and as did others who were with me, that we would sort of cross some kind of threshold of the way uh, we expect um, reality to behave. That's so all of a sudden it seemed to work on different terms. And that's really, in a certain sense, what has kept me in this, you know, fascinated with with the phenomena of hidden lands because they do seem to somehow uh function in a in a in a non-ordinary way it's incredible and in terms of your background and upbringing was your early life kind of accepting and open to doing this or did you have to defy and challenge uh, <laughs> what people expected of you to go out and do something so extraordinary and different no. No, very good question. And in this sense, I was extremely fortunate because my parents and family on both sides were immensely supportive of, of my eccentric adventures in the sense that my mother, well, when she was in college, her, her mentor and very close personal advisor was Joseph Campbell, the mm. great mythologist at, uh, who you know was a professor at Sarah Lawrence University for many, many years. And so you know, in a certain sense, my life in Asia and what I was doing there, she felt, was just a kind of enactment and, uh, of the kind of things that she'd been studying uh, mm. in college. So and I, but, but I could sort of live out. So I was very much brought up that way. On uh, my my parents were, you know, took me deep into the mountains when I was very young. Uh, it was nature. Uh, was for both of them almost really a, a spiritual. Uh, Phenomena, and it, uh, and so I think they both certainly understood my my deep passion for um, for the Himalayan world, and uh, and for climbing, and uh, you know, for all of the you know the cultural aspects that that um, Nepal in this case, which is where I first went, um, uh, led me, and so I was in that sense very very fortunate and that extended to others sort of extended family members as well my grandparents had um, you know taken me to the Alps when I was 13 and kind of basically when I was in the next year climbed the Matterhorn with their patronage and so it was all always something deep within our family tradition uh, of uh, of nature and exploration so, uh, yeah, so I, I, w I was very lucky in that sense. I didn't have to, I didn't have to uh, explain myself. It was, yes, it was yes. immediately understood. <laughs> you mentioned the um, how the totality of the experience includes both 
both good and bad, but not good and bad. It reminded me of what you were talking about, about your private conversation with the Dalai Lama and kind of the difference between how he speaks when he's speaking publicly with cameras rolling versus mm -hmm. uh, privately to a seeker. I was wondering uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, commenting on that a little bit. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I mean, the, I would, I've been very fortunate in that, that particularly early on, I was able to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama twice a year privately because of this is prior to his winning the Nobel Peace Prize when he became you know, his time became more and more in demand. Um, and I was able to bring groups of American college students uh, for audiences with him twice a year at his home in Dharamsala, India. So I always was able to arrange to have a private audience with him following those those meetings. So this went on over number, you know, several years. And so I was at that time, as I mentioned, seeing him twice a year and basically asking him for his, um, you know, his advice in terms of, of guiding me uh, in yeah. terms of my own spiritual and meditative practices. And so, you know, it's not, I think that there's so much a difference in the way he I publicly see. presents himself and teaches versus privately. But what I found so extraordinary about him was his ability somehow to to completely see in, at least in my own case, what what would be the most fruitful approach to Buddhist practice. So he introduced me, for example, which I write about in the heart of the world, to to a set of practices that, you know, from an external point of view can just seem almost outrageous, and yet which are a, a deep uh, and very, very important part of um, the most esoteric of the Tibetan Buddhist teachings called the Great... I think we just sold some books right there. <laughs> <laughs> With that one. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> All good. So, as I said, he he um, he did introduce me to this set of practices where he said, you know, you said, again, it sort of was the month thing. He said, you go off for a month to a place where no one will see you because if they do, they'll think you're crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. Again, <laughs> yeah. Again, it's like, hmm. Okay, I did it at home and my whole neighborhood thinks I'm crazy. Yeah. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I guess you know there are still certain things that should are better done in private. <laughs> so, so yes, uh, but exactly, but for me, what was really most extraordinary about that was just to see his his you know for me it was just the absolute verification that besides all of his other you know manifestations yeah. of wisdom and compassion that there was just an incredible sort of intuitive grasp of what's appropriate uh, you know for for people in, in, individually because I'm sure what he advised me to do uh, and was was not something that necessarily would have been something he would have advised for everyone right but it was it involved um, allowing yourself to embody these maybe these uh, what maybe Carl Jung would refer to as shadow uh, kind of um, aspects of the self in order to move through them and and integrate them would you say or, I would absolutely I would say that's a very very good analogy. I think, you know, with Carl Jung's sense uh, you know of, of archetypes that we that you know we have these collective universal um you could say um psychic um well archetypes really is is the best word that we invoke uh or that we experience that you know as he said as jung said if we don't bring them into our conscious attention then they they live themselves through us unconsciously and mm -hmm. in that respect can get us into lots of trouble so in this case yes it's very much working with a kind of conscious shadow work in the sense that those parts of the psyche that are often uh, you know, suppressed just because they're they're chaotic or they're difficult to to deal with or reconcile or explain are, are brought into conscious play uh, through through very very specific sets of practices. So very much, I think, what I engaged with on that that particular month retreat was um, uh, yeah was was work that allowed those shadow aspects of the psyche to fully emerge and therefore to be processed and therefore not to have the kind of subconscious hold that some of these archetypes can have on us if if we don't bring them into conscious awareness yeah in a sense knowing their name and exactly power over them yes yes exactly yeah now there's a tibetan uh, forgive me that what was the title tibetan healing a, a book that I wrote. Well, it was called "The Art of Tibet." Uh, the uh, Art of Tibetan, Tibetan Healing. Can yes. you tell us a little? I have to admit, I haven't read that book. Um, can no, you give us a little cool. bit of a synopsis? I'm very fascinated. I, I intend to read it. 
<laughs> Good. Well, it, it, the book is, is an introductory book that is, accompanies uh, details from a set of 17th century uh, Tibetan scroll paintings that illustrate the Tibetan medical tantras. Mm. So Tibetan medicine is a very unique system of medicine in that it integrates Indian Ayurveda, uh, Chinese traditional medicine, uh, and uh, indigenous Tibetan Bun, you could say almost shamanistic medicine. Um, and it brings these together into kind of a, a, a new synthesis that's very, very dynamic and powerful and works with, you know, an incredible range of, of farm, uh, his own kind of pharmacopoeia, um, as well as, as, um, as other practices. And so the book is essentially a, uh, works with this set of 79, uh, paintings that were created to serve as, um, you could say as visual guides for for Tibetan doctors in training at that time, mm. and so uh, the book I wrote was to kind of try to bring the essence of the Tibetan medical training into a more uh, accessible form through through the way that I presented these and and details from the each of the the scroll paintings. Um, so it was it was a great journey that also brought me uh, over a period of a year or so uh, to many many of the greatest Tibetan healers today and to experience and uh, these different modalities with which they work. Um, so it was a yeah a great project in that you know, that I embraced in a way very experientially and uh, at the same time the art alone uh, that these of these paintings is extraordinary because not only is it illustrating um, healing and medical techniques uh, from Tibet but it's also showing fantastically interesting vignettes of everyday life from 17th century Tibet that you don't otherwise see because the rest for the most part Tibetan art is all focused on on on, uh, on Buddha Buddhism and as a result these kind of just just scenes from everyday life are, are less less apparent Amazing. And Ian, how much would you say you had to, I guess, modernize the traditional forms of healing to be used and practiced and accepted in our current mm -hmm. culture? Because I know, you know, some certain techniques of Ayurveda that are still practiced may not be, or were, are, may not be uh, as accessible or accepted mm -hmm. in kind of the modern yep. Western culture. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, one of the probably more controversial aspects of both Ayurvedic medicine and uh, Tibetan medicine is the use of mercury, for example, uh, as a therapeutic <laughs> agent. <laughs> so yeah. it's, of course, the, the toxic effects of mercury are very well known <laughs> in both traditions. And, you know, actually one of the four great medical treatises of Tibet, uh, which are called the Gyushi or the four medical tantras, start out, one of them starts out with the sentence saying mercury is the greatest poison and it's also the greatest medicine if you know how to use it properly so it's it's um so contextualizing mercury was a challenge just mm -hmm. because you know, it is obviously in its unrefined form a, a a potent neurotoxin uh and yet it did sort of i i i was quite fascinated with this idea that the tradition was consciously aware of its of its dangers and yet nonetheless subscribed to using it in in what they would call purified form for longevity and powers and so I, I i researched that quite extensively both within the tibetan medical tradition and later among uh among alchemist wizards in in burma where there's a very very strong continuing practice of mercury-based alchemy in wow. remote monasteries in burma which was a fascinating project so i would say and so, so this way of trying to understand the role of mercury in not just in in uh, medicine and meditation is something that's still very, very uh, of great interest to me, and something that to some degree I'm working on uh, currently uh, in Burma. Um, but but just to go back to to the Tibetan tradition, because you're asking if there were, you know, otherwise it's the other traditions of of Tibetan medicine are quite straightforward they can be understood within the context of both traditional chinese medicine ayurveda i mean some of them are of course very strong they have powerful reactions but you know for example i had i'd had a very bad rock climbing accident when i was young when i was 22 and uh trying to sort of heal the residual effects of that were something that i it was an ongoing quest and one of the 
the big, huge breakthroughs for that was actually having a golden needle sunk into the top of my skull and having a, you know, um, a, a mugwort um, mixture lit on top of it, all of which I didn't feel for a moment. And then all of a sudden it was uh, by a Tibetan senior Tibetan doctor. And it just sort of it was suddenly like having a, you know, a spear just sort of sent down through your spinal column and right down to the core. Amazingly powerful. Uh uh, reaction, which actually relieved a lot of the, the residual trauma that I'd had uh, uh, from that accident. So again, some of the effects are, some of the techniques are what we would consider from a Western point of view, very invasive. Uh, and Well, actually no more invasive than surgery is for that matter, but done without anesthetic uh, can be, right. can feel more invasive. And yet has, uh, at least certainly in my case, in this instance, you know, very, very powerful remedial effect. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd say, I think a quite fascinating tradition and very, very rich in that it combines medicine, meditation, um, and draws from you know, a variety of traditions to try to come up with, with uh, a true mind-body medicine. How often or how much would you say that you integrate this in your current life? <laughs> Good. Uh, well, I was just in London. I'm, I'm up in Scotland now, in the Highlands, where I'm based. But I was just in London uh, until a couple of days ago, and I, I actually met with a with a Tibetan, um, Tibetan doctor there, who I know, and uh, picked up my latest little little bag of uh, of herbal formula called uh, Wang Chen, because you know they they're just wonderful substances i like i like using them i like the taste of them and they, they, there are some that are just which are called the ones i got are called chulen which means basically extracted essences so they are they function in a certain sense like an herbal tonic so that you don't it's not that you it's not that they're treating any specific um illness uh of any kind but they can just be taken as a general restorative uh for for the body and the mind together so so in that sense, yes, when the opportunity arises, I'll, I'll stock up. So do you have any projects that you're working on currently or anything that we can look forward to uh, seeing pop up on Amazon? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm finishing a long overdue book. It's called Tibetan Yoga Secrets from the Source. And yes. that will be <laughs> – I've been working on it for years and it's, <laughs> it's very uh, – and it got basically waylaid because of this big exhibition. Um, uh, exhibition that I did in London last year called to that secret temple that basically took three years to prepare oh, for. And, um, that I'll just, I'll just kind of back up a minute and say that, 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 um, that exhibition was about representing, uh, a set of 17th century murals in what had been the private meditation chamber for Tibet's sixth Dalai Lama. Mm. Uh, and essentially the tongue, the, the murals serve as a, a visual guide of the path to enlightenment, uh, in it from, from the non-monastic yogic tradition. So a very, very powerful set of what were once secret murals. And we presented them in London at this exhibition, uh, along with about 115 other objects to kind of contextualize tantric Buddhism and concepts of, of mind, body, and meditation. So this book, which I'm doing, was essentially doing the same thing, except that I just didn't, I wasn't able to just finish it because of all the obligations that I had at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am now, and that book will be looking in greater depth at these, what these uh, practices uh, are, which are essentially the, the six yogas, as they're often referred to, the six yogas of Naropa or Naguma. They're a set of, uh, of practices that can be done at different stages of waking, dreaming, sleeping, even dying, uh, in order to awaken uh, the Buddha nature, the depth consciousness, that, you know, that, that aspect of awareness that goes beyond thoughts and emotions and self-identification, um, but also deals very, very deeply with the light meditations uh, associated with Dzogchen or the great perfection tradition of Tibet. So the book will be heavily illustrated because for, for years and years I've been kind of documenting very, very, um, not only wall paintings in Tibet, but also practitioners in very remote parts of the Himalayas and who have been willing to, to share some of these otherwise um, esoteric secret traditions and 
the reason I, I feel that this is appropriate is it was very much an ins- the Dalai Lama's own request of me when I did my first book called The Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, mm-hmm. when I had shown him images of um, this temple in Tibet that his predecessor had, had actually meditated in. And he, before I even had said anything, he said, please make a book about these. And I said, well, aren't these secret practices? And he said, time of secrecy is over. He said, when these things remain secret, they'll just remain misunderstood. So please, you know, do your best and oh, and wow. and reveal fully uh, what these practices are about. Because he said uh, these these practices are very very relevant, especially he said for the Western world, where the, because they are from a non monastic uh, perspective and yeah. therefore they're about integrating with everyday life. They are in that sense the epitomes of the tantric tradition, which as you know was a a way of embracing. Uh, life and not renouncing um, the human condition, but actually transforming it through a full, fully embracing all aspects of our humanity. And so that's what this book will be about. And I'm also engaged now with a new um, exhibition that will uh, be launched in London in 2020 at a very, very major museum, I, I, which I'm not, I can't mention yet. Mm-hmm. But it will be public knowledge soon. Nice. Uh, and that's going to be extremely exciting because it's really going to be looking at the experiential side of, of tantric Buddhist art and how these images and icons and archetypes were all about ways of inducing certain states of awareness, states, states of consciousness, and for transforming the, you know, the human condition in, in, in the largest sense. So this will be uh, an exhibition really about the dialogue between, between science and, uh, and tantric Buddhism, uh, as well as, you could say, the latest technologies in order to, to show uh, uh, how we can actually shift consciousness from uh, into much larger and expansive states of awareness that, that, that uh, become beneficial not just individually but, but for society as a whole. I've seen some of those tests um, where they they measure the brain waves of of monks that have been meditating mm-hmm. all their lives and when they're in yep. meditative states and I mean I don't know I don't know enough about brain waves to be as impressed as the scientists seem to be. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, to be honest, I think there's scientists who are who you know who I'm working with now neuroscientists who say well you know you know that in some ways. The, the the brain scans are very misleading because they they actually are still icons of our very uh, head centric Western approach to That's things true. because as as we know there are just as many neurons in the heart and in the the viscera the gut than there are in the brain mm. and so by only doing brain scans and 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 in a certain sense ignoring entirely what's happening in the heart and the and yeah, the gut the experiential aspect of it. Rather yeah, than it just, learning to meditate, they're looking at <laughs> the brain scans of the monk. The, uh, <laughs> and as one, as one neuroscientist recently told me, he said, "Well, this looks so impressive, uh, you know, this state of you know what we what in a way is is imaged here in a state of deep meditation." But she said, "Honestly, you get the same image if you just prick somebody suddenly with a pin." <laughs> <laughs> So that sort of puts a lot of this in perspective, you know, basically it's showing that the brain in a state of sudden, you could say, shock, goes into kind of a defense mode that can light up the brain in very impressive ways. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> so in other words, yeah, we, we shouldn't be entirely uh, misled by the by these pretty, pretty mandalas of the brain, as it were. But then that makes me think of some of those traditions with the... Uh, you know the the meditative states where they're they're bringing bringing deities into play with music and banging drums and blowing mm-hmm. through trumpets made from human bones and things like that and and it, it, it explores a lot more than just kind of the you know like what people often think of when they think of Buddhism is like more the Zen Buddhism where it's just just silence just yep. a rock garden you know mm-hmm. so so this for for people grounded in that sometimes you start well, not you but some all start talking about tantric. Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and they just say, oh, well, that's just a bunch of, that's not even Buddhism, that's just a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, well, I think those kind of perspectives tend to, you know, be subconsciously conditioned by our own sort of Western exactly. uh, Christian inheritance and puritanical views of what right. religion is supposed to the be. Puritan's but looking at the, at the Catholics, yeah. yeah. Yeah, basically, it's a kind of covert Catholicism masquerading yeah. as, as, as Buddhism because, I mean, the beauty, in a way, of Tantric Buddhism was its full embrace of, you know, to some degree, the very same things that Siddhartha Gautama, before he became Buddha, renounced. But basically, he'd, 
you know, he'd been through the whole <laughs> the whole drama of the passions right. uh, and, um, you know, found another way. But I think this was really the beauty of the uh, the tantric revolution, if one wants to call it that within Buddhism, is it made Buddhism relevant in ways that it hadn't been outside of monastic communities which had by their own accounts often fallen into a kind of sterile scholasticism mm. uh, by the 6th and 7th centuries in the time that the tantric uh, Buddhist texts first began to appear. And they were radical texts and they were often vehemently rejected by uh, Buddhist monastic communities and only gradually over centuries did in some ways they become reintegrated into monastic Buddhism but more importantly they, as they were initially they were they were expansions um, from of the wisdom and compassion at the foundation of Buddhism but applying it as a literally as the as, as a method as the as the lightning method the, the of the thunder path which is in a certain sense what Vajra Vajrayana, the diamond path, really refers to. These were ways of accelerating uh, transformation, liberation, and power, uh, rather than, as the conventional Buddhist tradition says, after many, many lifetimes, if you're lucky, you might, you know, might attain <laughs> enlightenment. But the Buddhist, you know, the tantric approach was, well, why, why wait? Why not, you know, uh, take the result as the path, as it were, mm. and uh, presents things in that way. And as long as, you know, as the Dalai Lama himself has said, you know, when motivated by, by compassion and altruistic um, ethical orientation, then, you know, it is. There's, it's, it's such an incredible embrace of all of life uh, and, of, you know, of the shadows and the light, uh, to use the, you know, the Jungian sense and bringing about that union of opposites. Um, that, in a certain sense, we would have to say is on a relative level, you know, what Jung referred to as the individuation process and would, in Buddhism, be a process of liberation. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for being you. and. Yeah, uh, this is, I love all of yeah, this. Yeah, you're so special and such a light, and, you know, transmitting uh, and communicating and just delivering in a creative way all of the sacred knowledge and wisdom to the mainstream um, is beautiful and well, special I, and it takes so much courage for you to be able to you know just surrender and be open to you know trying this there's so much courage and uh mm obedience i guess to something outside of you yeah an inspiration yeah so yeah. thank you well no my pleasure and I'm, i was very you know very grateful to be able to to participate in your you know wonderful uh, podcasts that really i think are tapping into to as we know what as you know the esoteric is always of course that which is most essential well thank and you yet, which, and yet it's we're at the it's the underground current that keeps <laughs> keeps life going yeah so so as I said, I'll, I'll be looking forward to even paying more attention. And uh, to, <laughs> now we, that I we're starting up a uh, another podcast soon called "What Would Yeshi Do?" Uh huh. Uh huh. So in the in, in light of that, um, I don't know. I guess that's the question: What would Yeshi do? Like looking at the world as it is today, you know, mm. kind of going to work, running to keep up, driving to work. You know, um, in this in this world, in this Western world. Like, what would that look like if somebody became awakened to these mysteries in mm. in the West? I mean, I'm sure yep. it would be individuated, like not everyone would look the same. But I, did you have any thoughts about that? Well, it's it's very interesting that you that you actually mention it because we're, we're actually, uh, you know, I'm going to Tibet next month. Um, and I'll, I'll be there for about six weeks and uh, I'm going to Mount Kailash in particular in western Tibet because uh, we're making a film there mm -hmm. uh, about this mountain at the center of the world, um, which, which, as you know, for Buddhists and Hindus represents, in a certain sense, the, the, the axis mundi um, of the planet. Uh, but we're also doing a film based upon footage that I have from years ago of, um, of an extraordinary uh, Tibetan yogini who lives uh, just below the cave where uh, Yeshi Tsogyal attained enlightenment practicing the secret yogas of inner heat uh, in the 8th century. And so part of that 
film project, uh, which is which we're actually just going to make an initial trailer about from previous footage in, in the hopes to actually raise fund to do a more full film is actually in a certain funny way exactly as about what you're saying. These are yoginis who live in the uh, beneath the cave of where Yoshisogya attained enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And the question that the film will be asking is, you know, how are they expressing Yoshisogya's own aspirations in their lives today? And what do they see as the trajectory of those um, of those practices in the contemporary world? So I think it's an incredibly important Perfect. Uh, story uh, that you're asking, what would Yeshi do? Because she was such an extraordinary being. I always thought that her life story would make an incredible sort of Hollywood feature film you know, yeah. about a, a young and beautiful Tibetan princess who's given away to some, you know, uh, not Scarlett Johansson, please. <laughs> no, we got to we got to find out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically to the you know the, to the the tantric sage from India who probably at that time didn't speak any Tibetan. Um, and then you know gets whisked off into the into the ice caves uh, to practice esoteric tantric practices, and goes off afterwards into incredible adventures across the Himalayas with her consorts in Nepal, and you know an incredible story. Mm -hmm. And so you know her her life, the challenges that she went through in her life, which are which are extraordinary, um, and which are in some ways reflected by by these. Um, nuns who are practicing in her tradition today um you know is something i think of enormous interest so so i'll be very interested to hear more about what you're doing with that and yeah. see you know, if it, if it goes to... farther to look at possible collaborative ways of oh, yes bringing that story into to kind of a filmic form um that you know really asks that question on a, on a on a larger level yeah oh and i would love if you um if you were to be able to refer, you know, anyone who might be interested in coming on here and, and talking a little bit about that question, who mm -hmm. might be involved with that, or you sure, know, sure, I can do that because there are there are certainly people. I'm sure you know many, but there are of course many many uh, women I know in the states who are very much following in the tradition of Yeshugyal and would I'm sure be very happy to share some of their perspectives. The other person I'm thinking of is, she's literally an extraordinary woman, a Bhutanese yogini, and probably only in her mid-30s now, who's coming out of a two consecutive three-year meditation retreats in Bhutan, wow. um, in which she would refuse to cut her hair and become a nun from her teacher as one of the great, great, you know, lamas of Bhutan, because she said, my role model is Yeshit Sogyal. Mm. And she practiced the tantra. She did not renounce the world. She basically embraced it fully. Wow. So she comes literally out next week from her second three-year solitary retreat. So she would be – her English is actually very good. Uh, but she, she has cool. it's an amazing voice. I mean I, I, I'm not sure that she would be willing to <laughs> – sense expose herself yet uh, <laughs> but she would be a fascinating person to meet without recording it fascinating person and as i said a, a very very close friend of mine uh so i will i will bridge the i'll bridge the subject Thank with you. her wow. uh because it would be really from someone who's just dedicated their life to to following the example of yeshi sogyal on oh, every perfect. level yeah that's yeah. exactly what what the voice that i that we feel called to help amplify what out of curiosity what languages have you learned i speak uh well i speak tibetan and nepalese mm -hmm. uh, and in, in terms of asian languages uh that's really all and then just yeah uh, some smattering of european languages like norwegian but that's so that's that i'm sure it help definitely helps with uh interviewing people and, and getting to know people because probably Yes. No. Speaking, having the local languages is was enormously important for for my access to to, to these traditions. Would and, you say they're uh, difficult languages? Uh, Nepalese is fairly straightforward. Tibetan more difficult, but okay. I don't think either of them are particular are, are anywhere as difficult as let's say certain other uh, Mandarin. That's like, what I was like thinking. Mandarin. <laughs> Japanese are, or it would be would be much more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> for yeah. sure. For sure. So they're in the realm of possibility. Definitely. <laughs> my, my growing up, my dad and I were always driving around the mountains here, the Angeles Crest Mountains, and he uh -huh. was looking for the Baul here, 
Ah. He, 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 he was, we were always pulling over and he was like being magnetically drawn to an area and then he'd say, this, this is a power spot here or he'd mm. hear about one from someone else. So we were always going and meditating in power spots and focusing on our third eye and stuff like that. So oh. I'm looking forward to going to uh, the actual Beul. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, the Beul are everywhere. I'm yeah, gonna... that, that was the, kind of the idea is that you Can don't you have to go to Tibet. Where, where are you located? Los Angeles. Oh, in Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we just go up to the Angeles Crest Mountains up here and drive yeah. around. And there are some powerful spots, you know, and, you know, weird clearings where it's like, why aren't there any trees in this circle? You know, probably because there were native, you know, tribes that were practicing sure. in that spot for mm -hmm. who knows how many centuries, you know. And, uh, yeah. So it's interesting. No, well, there's there's tremendous amount of thing, you know, a lot going out there. I'm actually supposed to go to L.A. So, I mean, it's funny. I, oh, cool. I just got an email yesterday because of a, it's a, another film project, which I didn't mention, mm -hmm. on uh, Tibetan on tantric Buddhist art, which I'm involved with. They I may they may need to have me come to L.A. soon. So oh, cool. we'll see what happens. What's but, the name uh, of that one? Uh, it's got a working title, Mandala, but it may okay. it may change. Um but it will be yeah, partly filmed in Tibet and elsewhere, and but kind of going in deeply into the the world of um, of, of tantric art and how it invokes experiences, and in a certain sense that we we embody we embody the art in that respect. So we'll see we'll see where that all goes. Um, but uh, no, really, it was a pleasure to to participate in your likewise. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for coming on here. Thank you thank very you. much, Ian. Thank you, both of you, and uh, yeah, look forward to being in touch. Bye for now. Bye for now. Bye, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Ian Baker, for being our guest on this debut episode of the What Would Yes You Do podcast. And thank you also to Yoga in the Park. Los Angeles. The Yoga in the Park fundraiser is coming up Saturday, June 17th, 9 a.m. to noon at Pan Pacific Park on the lawn at the corner of Beverly and Gardner. All proceeds presented to the Best in Drag show and all info can be found at yogainthepark.la.org. Thank you all for tuning in. Good night.